Good morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's program. Please stay tuned at the end of today's program and I'll provide you with a brief update of some terrific upcoming live stream and in-person programming. For those of you who would like to submit questions today, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Claire Krellitz, our communications manager and digital producer, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, which should start in about 30 or 35 minutes. Today's program is entitled, The Global Rise of Authoritarianism, Will Putin Lead the Way? This is part of our ongoing series, Putin's Gamble, which investigates the roots and global implications of Russia's war in Ukraine. We are very pleased to have joining us today as our speaker, Gideon Rockman, who is the chief foreign affairs columnist at the Financial Times. He is also author of Age of the Strongman. Our moderator is Dr. Stephen Fish, who is a political scientist at UC Berkeley. So Dr. Fish and Gideon Rockman, let me bring you on because we are so eager to have you join us and get this very important discussion ongoing. Hello, Mr. Rockman. Hi. Hello. Thank you, Stephen. I'll turn this over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kim, and it's a delight to be able to work with Gideon, who I, whose work I have admired from afar for, for some time, and to be engaged in this conversation with him today about his new book is, is a real pleasure. You know, I'm intrigued by the fact that the title of our, of our program today is, the, is uh, the Rise of Global Authoritarianism, Will Putin Lead the Way? And given the events of the last three months, I'm tempted, tempted to ask whether we might want to ask now whether we should entitle this the, uh, the fall of global authoritarianism, will Putin lead the way? Putin, after all, has been, as Gideon points out in his book, I think with great skill, really, Putin is the gold standard. And Putinism is the gold standard of international autocracy. Putin, as Gideon points out in his book, really is the mentor uh, for so many other autocrats around the world, whether it be MBS, the, the dictator of Saudi Arabia, um, raging all the way to, uh, to President Duterte of the Philippines. And of course, we all know what Trump thinks of Putin. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, watching, watching Putin himself show himself to be not the rational, cold-eyed, smart calculator that we've long associated him as being, but as someone who's kind of gone off the rails, who's, in, who's started a war with terrible consequences for Russia based on some very stupid assumptions, like the notion that the Ukrainians would all would just roll over and take this, like the idea that he could send 150,000 troops into a country whose people are hostile to him and somehow invade it and annex it. Uh, so we've seen Putin himself falter, and we've also seen autocracy itself, autocracy falter. Russia has been the global standards of global standard of, of autocracy now for, for 20 years. And what we're seeing is all the rot that we find in so many autocracies, namely the corruption, interfering not only with quality of life in this country, but with the country's ability to prosecute a war. We've seen so much rot in the military that you know, it looks like Russia doesn't, can't really field an army, a Navy and an Air Force that's capable of getting the job done in this much smaller, much weaker country. So I guess my first standard, my first question to Gideon is, how would you reflect on the events of the last 90 days in terms of the reputation of autocracy in the world and Putin among fellow autocrats? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. This is feels like a turning point, although, you know, all of us who study history know that it takes a little while to be totally sure of the meaning of events. But I think that the the way things are going, it does look a little like that. And, or, you know, put a counterfactual, if Putin, as he had expected, apparently had won in three or four days, I think his global prestige and the prestige of the model that he represents would have soared again. And there, his critique that, you know, the West is weak and can't act and is confused, I'm decisive and strong. A lot of people, uh, his fan club would have grown and others would have been tempted to do the same, you know, that China would have begun to look with even more enthusiasm at maybe now now's the time to go after Taiwan. I think the calls in India 
for a military solution to Kashmir might have might have risen. You know, military action, decisive, strong man style military action would have been back in fashion. But as it happens, as you point out, as we can all see, it's gone the other way. Uh, he's really got bogged down. And I think it does illustrate the, the weakness in the strongman model uh, of government. Uh, and that is in large part that after a, long, after a while, these leaders, and Putin's been in power for 20 years, begin to A, lose touch with reality. They're quite often become sort of megalomaniacal and paranoid. But also, it becomes harder and harder to say no to them. So they can begin to live in their own world, and nobody is able to say, you know, Mr. President, I think this invasion plan is, may not work. He doesn't want to hear that. And people who might say that to him have been weeded out. I mean, I remember just before the invasion talking to Dmitry Trenin, who I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, you know, the Carnegie Endowment guy. Uh, who's fairly, you know, he's a Russian patriot uh, and fairly conservative for somebody working for a Western think tank. But I said to him, look, you know, ahead of a war in the West, you would have hawks and doves, uh, you know, around the president, some saying don't go, some saying don't, you know, is there something similar happening in Russia with Putin? And he said, absolutely not, because anybody who isn't a yes man has been weeded out of the Kremlin a long time ago. And he's a czar, you know, um, this is even more of one man rule than even the Soviet period where, you know, post Stalin, you had votes in the Politburo and so on. Uh, Putin in this case, it's down to him, it's his decision. And as a result, I think both the man and the model are potentially discredited by this. However, although it'd be lovely to believe, well, that's it, this is the end. Uh, you know, from my study of strong men through the ages, they're very, very hard to weed out. I mean, that's almost the point of being a strong man is that you don't give up power easily. And, you know, it should be remembered, Stalin dies of natural causes, Mao dies of natural causes. Um, you know, absent defeat in a war, which is what, you know, does for Hitler, uh, Franco dies of natural causes. You know, the, the, unless there's a war or a coup, these guys are very, very hard to get out of power. So it's possible both that Putin has failed, that the strongman model has been discredited, and he's still around for quite a long time. You know, it's hard to it's hard to remain the legitimate ruler of Russia, though, if you've proven that you can't even protect the national patrimony. And while Russia is not losing a war in the sense that Hitler lost a war, this will not lead to Russia through the occupation of Russia by other countries. This is a remarkably humiliating loss. And if the war continues to go this the way it is right now, I think it might be safe to say in, in as little as a few months time that Putin has lost this war. Now, again, this will not lead to the occupation of Russia, so you're not going to get the same dynamic that you did in, in other post-strongman countries where the strongmen are literally thrown out of power, the regimes are dissolved, they, they kill themselves, as in, as in Hitler's case, and so on. But do you think that actually losing this war, especially given the fact that Putin's whole raison d'etre, his whole reason for being in power, has been to elevate Russia's global status in the world. And this war has had, of course, a real deflationary effect in that respect. The whole fact that his legitimacy has rested on his strength, his ability to guard the, the motherland, that that might be enough to lead to a, to a palace coup against him. And if that happens, what kind of future do you see then for Russia? This, as you pointed out, is a profoundly personalist system. And it's hard to get rid of these personalist leaders, as you, as you mentioned. But personal systems are also exceptionally brittle. Once the main man at the top falters, pretty much anything can happen. Exactly. When you, it's impossible, of course, to say what's going to happen after this guy is thrown out of power. But there certainly are plenty of rumors in Moscow that I'm sure you're aware of us right now, which is that factions are forming. And this kind of competition around who's going to get the first crack at the guy. We never, we don't know what that Zoom call to Putin's going, going to look like when he's told that if this ever happens, that he's told that for his the purpose, the sake of his own health, that he's going to be restricted to whatever luxurious bunker he's in at the time. His personal communications are going to have to be restricted, and that you know the ballet music comes on in Russia. And there's an announcement he, that he is no longer in charge. That seemed like an absurd prospect three months ago. Right now, it doesn't seem so crazy. If you can, if you can just reflect for us on what you think Putin's fall, if it happens under these circumstances, might look like, and what might ensue in Russia after that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think crucial. I mean, great questions and crucial questions. I mean, start with a bit of history. You know. Putin is uh, fancies himself a historian, and you know the, the the prelude to the invasion 
was this great historical essay, and he'd obviously been about the unity of Russia and Ukraine, seems mm -hmm. to have been written by him. Um, but um, one bit of Russian history that he may have overlooked is the role of losing wars in, in regime change in Russia. You know, most obviously, uh, yeah. the, the Russian Revolution is provoked by the, the failure in the First World War. And I was talking to the great historian Dominic Levin, you know, who said that there was a, a memorandum written by a guy called Dumovo in 1914 saying almost exactly this, if we go to war, there'll be a revolution. He was right. And indeed, you know, the 1905 loss of the Russo-Japanese War leads to an attempted revolution around then and an upheaval. And arguably, uh, I'm told, the death of uh, I think it's Nicholas I, uh, you know, comes after the failure of the Crimean War, possibly by suicide. So, so yeah, there's a few historical precedents for Russian leaders and Russian autocratic leaders losing power because wars have gone badly. Um, how it might happen now, I mean, I think that you know, political scientists of your department rather than mine, but from what I can gather, um, those who sort of attempted quantitative analysis of how authoritarian regimes change say that it is more likely to be a palace coup than an uprising in the streets, that mm. uh, that that tends to be the way it's done. Um, and you painted a very vivid picture, I'm now imagining, of, you know, the, the Zoom call and all that. But I think, you know, maybe we're back in the whole era of criminology that we we had in the in the Cold War, where people are trying to analyze who's up, who's down, where the factions are, and so on. I'm always reminded of that uh, great Churchill line about uh, trying to figure out what's happening inside the Kremlin is what like watching dogs fighting underneath the carpet, so that right. you can see the carpet's moving a lot and somebody's biting somebody, but but who's doing what? You can't really tell. There's some just something going on, and so uh, you know. I'm sure it would be there are conversations going on, but whether that can cohere into a coherent plot that actually gets the guy out, don't know. I mean, somebody else pointed out to me, he really looks after his bodyguards to the extent that his bodyguards are very rich men in their own right. You know, they've got estates and so on. Uh, he he think, takes his personal security seriously, um, as one would expect. But yeah, if you just look at the objective circumstances, there has to be a chance that somebody says, this ain't working. And what is more to get out of this, the only way we can do is get rid of the guy who started it because otherwise we're shackled with this losing war. You need a new person to come in. He's, Putin can't say this was a mistake or, or invent a way out. So you need a new person to do that. Um, and who that new person is, we don't know. Um, but let's say it happens. I'm one of those sort of optimists who like to believe whatever a place that, that if Putin goes, the chances are it'll be better. Of course, I have pessimistic friends who say, you know, don't be so sure. It could be anarchy, um, a, anarchy in a country with, you know, almost half the world's nuclear weapons. Uh, or it could be that Putin actually is not an aberrational figure. He, the kind of nationalism that he represents is pretty deep among in the Russian elite. So you're not going to have a liberal taking over. But on the other hand, you may have a more realistic nationalist, a nationalist who understands that, as you point out, what, what they've been doing has deeply damaged the country and they have to find a way out of it because the economy is, is uh, very, very isolated now. And, you know, somebody was pointing out to me that, you know, even things like oil production, which are very, very, you know, crucial to their revenue streams. Well, if, if companies like Schlumberger, who maintain oil rigs, pull out, you're not clear that, that, that at a certain stage, these oil rigs are gonna start breaking down. Does Russia have the domestic capacity without the foreign oil firms to keep its, its key industries going? Um, so yeah, I, I think that I'm, you know, although in my previous answer, I pointed out that these guys are very, very hard to get rid of. It's gotta be possible that, that, that something happens and in a rational world, it would happen at some point. Indeed, and even if he's not thrown out of power, still his vast, his already vastly diminished status has got to reduce his appeal as a role model to other auto autocratizers and would, you know, which is the word I use for would-be autocrats like Trump or Modi, these guys who are in countries where there's still open elections, but clearly leaders who want to do away with democracy and stay in power as long as they can. And they love Putin in part because He's got what they want. He's got a, he can be in power for life. He's 
got more money than God and he has some popularity at home. And it seems like that's what kind of one of the things that ties together all these all these autocrats, these strong men and these would be autocrats, these autocratizers that you talk about in your book. Certainly among them, uh, Putin's status is going to be diminished. Do you think in other countries with, auto with, with Putin wannabes in power, like for example, the Philippines, they just had their election recently, Duterte of course couldn't run for reelection, but in a country like that, in Hungary, in the United States, crucially, of course, most of all, that yeah. somehow in Brazil, who's, which has elections coming up soon, mm -hmm. that the disgrace and diminished prestige, even if he's still in power of Putin, could somehow redound to the harm of these guys. And if so, what would liberals in these, in these countries, defenders of democracy in Brazil and the United States and Hungary and other countries have to do to tie Putin very clearly to there would be autocratizers and yeah. to try to bring him bring them down a notch in this respect i have to admit just just to add this this point here i'm actually surprised and shocked and dismayed that the democrats so far have not made a bigger deal of the fact that trump literally shilled for this invasion two days before and his mouthpiece tucker carlson on fox news shilled for this invasion before it happened and they still haven't backed away from the support for putin now if the democrats can't do something like something with that and if all they got to talk about still is gas prices i think they're doing something wrong how do you think do you think putin's diminution in authority can reduce the authority of putin's wannabes around the world in in, in autocracies or countries that aren't quite autocracies yet like the united states or india and what do you think liberal Democrats can do to try to press the fact that their Putin wannabes, in fact, are associated with a man who's suddenly become something of a failure? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I think that the would-be autocrats won't change their minds because they they have their own motivations to be autocrats. They may be less admiring of Putin, but they will find other reasons to argue that, uh, you know, you need you need me. Um, and indeed, if you look at a Bolsonaro, his role model, I mean, you mentioned the ones who do have looked at Putin, and I think Trump was one of them, but uh, Duterte, uh, Orban, these are people who are on the record as admirers of Putin. Bolsonaro mm -hmm. actually admired Trump. Um, you know, he, he liked the idea of being the Trump of the tropics. And I think one of the things that worries me is that, you know, Putin must know at some level he's cornered, but he, he may feel that his ace in the hole is the Republican Party. Um, yes. That, uh, that if he waits long enough, uh, if he can get, make it to the midterms, you know, then the, the atmosphere will begin to change in the United States. That although the Russian economy, as we were saying, is in trouble, the Western economy will also be in trouble. And that if people are fixated by gas prices, by rising inflation, then the Tucker Carlson type voices will be raised and saying, you know, we're bankrupting ourselves with this conflict that's not even ours. Um, that we we should back off. Uh, we're on another crazy crusade. That's uh, that's a bad bad idea. And that you know, if he can really wait till 2024 and Trump is back in power, uh, you know, he's back in business because I think Trump would not support Ukraine. Um, and indeed, obviously, I think that the the victory of Macron and the failure of Le Pen will have been a blow to to uh, to Putin. But he has other horses in the race. You know, Salvini could come to power in Italy. Uh, etc. Orban already plays a useful role for him, you know, in blocking the oil embargo within the within the EU. Uh, so I don't think the Putin fan club uh, is going to go away, although they may stop talking as much about Putin. I mean, Netanyahu is another one who, you know, campaigned in the last election with a poster of him shaking hands with uh, right. Putin, saying, you know, in a different league. Uh, that was his argument. Now he'll use another photo next time. But uh, but the argument will, will be essentially a bit similar. But I mean, I think so. It, it's more that the second order effects. Uh, if you're appealing to people who are in the middle, uh, who are unconvinced, maybe you can make something of this failure of Putin because I think that his whole discourse was Western democracy is rotten, Western democracy is weak, hypocritical, and in a way, Trump was marvelous for him not just because Trump admired him. But also that Trump said the same things, you know, exactly. uh, famously, you know, when somebody said to Trump, you know, doesn't Putin killed a lot of people? His response was, well, we kill a lot of people, too. Right. And that's exactly the Russian discourse. 
that there's no difference, you know, that we're hypocrites. And, and here we have a president of the United States saying that, perfect. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, Putin has gathered a lot of admirers in the West and around the world with his argument that he represents a kind of macho traditionalism that is much better than the woke West, which is actually falling apart. That's broadly speaking his argument. Now, if he begins to fail, and actually the so-called ineffective woke West has rallied, has managed to impose very swinging sanctions, has stuck together, has added members to NATO, really pushed him back, then that whole narrative that he has promoted and which was attracting followers uh, begins to look less convincing. Indeed. So I think that's where um, it's helpful. Um, it's not like authoritarians will say, oh, you know what, authoritarians is a bad idea. They're not going to right. do that. But but the people who might be swayed by this argument of Western decadence, which incidentally was a powerful argument in the 1930s, which is why a lot of people in yes. the West began to sympathize with Mussolini or Hitler. They said, well, you know what, Stalin, maybe he's got a point. You know, the trains are running on time, all that kind of stuff. And that was, Putin was sort of rerunning that argument. Uh, and if, as you say, Russia is now revealed as this sort of ineffective, corrupt, failed place. I mean, right down to the military prowess. You heard conservatives in, in the US saying, well, you know, we have this ridiculous woke army where we prosecute our soldiers and allow gays into the military. You know, they wouldn't do that in Russia. And as a result, you know, they'll be really effective in the field and we won't. Well, actually, right. it turns out the Russian army is deeply ineffective and maybe right. it's not such a great idea to have a very ill-disciplined army that commits war crimes and follows the, doesn't follow the rules of war. It doesn't work. So that kind of thing is, is helpful. I mean, just finally on the sort of, you know, can the Democrats make more of this? Yeah, I would have thought. I don't know whether attack ads even exist anymore in the online age, but surely that clip of Trump saying, you know, he's a genius, which he said two days before the invasion, he called right. Putin a genius, uh, you know, and then uh, link it to, to that. I mean, it's words speak for themselves, but I've given up on trying to work out what works in Western politics, given that, you know, I would have thought that Trump said so many disastrous things that he was utterly unelectable, but apparently he was like that. So. Well, Gideon, one of my, I guess my response to that would be, I think the reason for that, the reason for the, the Trump's awful statements never seem to redound to his harm is that the Democrats don't amplify them. We, we you know, liber the liberal temperament always says, well, ordinary folks, they're reasonable, they'll hear the outrageous things that Trump is saying, and they'll get what an outrage Trump is. But I don't think most people who are, sporadically attentive to politics necessarily do. I mean, liberal Democrats have to drive home every day. This is what treason looks like. Yeah. This is the president. Well, it was interesting, you know, I was just down in Washington and I was talking to somebody in the, the Biden team and I said, you know, as an outsider, I just find it baffling that Trump hasn't been prosecuted yet for his role in January the 6th. And this guy said rather weakly uh, to me, uh, well, it would be very divisive to do that, you know. Ugh. I mean, the Democrats seem to see innocuousness as the highest virtue. And what's more, they always want to leave it to the courts at any rate. What about prosecuting him publicly? What about prosecuting him in, in, our, in our whole ad campaign? Why yeah. not also, why not run on, the fact, on saving democracy in America and saving the world? Biden is saving the world right now. It sounds like a bit of an exaggeration, but certainly he's standing where FDR did vis-a-vis Churchill, that would be Zelensky right now, and he's got a 39% approval rating. I think one of the reasons for that is that he's saving the world. He's doing a, a he's doing a, an incredible job, really, at organizing the West, uh, coordinating these sanctions. The pro, I, it'd be hard to find a more skillful, you know, spectacularly skillful show than Biden has put on. But shh, don't tell the folks; it might distract their attention from gas prices. We don't hear about it in the United States. It's not in the ads. It's not out in the air. If I were Biden, I'd talk about nothing else. I would call the American people together and say, we're at a hinge of history where you're facing this. You know, we've never faced anything of this kind of moral and political magnitude, you know, gravity since World War II. And I, your captain, am leading us to this successfully through this battle. What's more, the Democrats also have this other little issue that they can run on, which is Democracy, saving yeah. democracy. One could argue, in fact, that Biden has been handed two Lincoln-sized tasks. All Lincoln had to do was save the union. Biden is asked to save democracy in America and democracy and peace abroad. 
Absolutely. The second task, it seems like he's doing a spectacular job with, but isn't telling the folks about. And he's not purling that into his a message that you know, he's the best man to save democracy at, at home as well. This is so kind it's, of a... It's, I, I wonder whether that, that's as potent a message as one would like to believe it is. Because if you look at the polling evidence, I don't actually have my book uh, to hand or I couldn't find the appropriate page at the right moment. But there was polling evidence in the US and in, even in Britain. The number of people who, who believe that democracy is essential is falling. Uh, and actually falling particularly amongst the young. It's an older generation who maybe remember the Cold War or you know, were brought up by parents who were, you know, remember the Second World War, who really believe that democracy is a key, key value. But I think once you get to people, you know, below the age of 40, 30, that falls off quite sharply. Uh, I mean, amazingly and disturbingly. And in, in the UK, uh, that stuff I do remember, something like 56% said, the, uh, you know, we need a strong man leader who's prepared to break the rules. And this is Britain, which regards itself as, you know, among the most established democracies of the world. And I think in the United States, similarly, um, you know, there's quite a strong constituency for whom democracy is not necessarily as high a value as, as one would hope. That said, I think part of the reason for that is that the leadership don't make a big deal of the fact that democracy is in danger. People don't know that it's really in danger. What's more, you can't really poll on democracy's popularity. I think the Democrats run everything according to issue polls. Yeah. They, they, they have a series of issues, health care, taxes, inflation, and so on. And it's hard to stick saving the world in there as an issue yeah. or saving democracy in there as an issue. And but also the point is, so, I think, that, you know, the, 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 the there's a, a group of the public that are so befuddled that they think Trump's saving democracy. I mean, the, you know, the number of Republicans who believe the election was stolen, who have chosen to believe it, it's a majority. So but this, that is, this to me is, an, is, is, is a product and part of the fact that Biden doesn't say as often as Trump, and Trump says that he won, Biden doesn't read the numbers and say he won. All we hear all the time is that, is that Trump won from Trump. Biden actually doesn't say he won. What's more, Biden doesn't spell out in lurid detail, what a post-democratic America would look like, what what things would look like in the world right now if Trump were president instead of Biden himself. What a disaster this would be for, for American business, for the world to be basically living in a Xi, Trump, Putin, mercantilist, you know, world where strategic corruption rather than market forces <laughs> rule the global economy. In a world where um, if you want to make democracy, I'm finding with my students popular again, is you tie it to the social justice issues that they take seriously. They, they might not be as crazy about democracy as their, their parents or even my students five years ago were because they identify with Trump. But at the same time, to show that everything they care about, LGBT rights, women's empowerment, racial equality, and so on, all depends on democracy. All those things that, that, that good lefties care about all depend on democracy right now is one way I find to actually excite them about democracy and about saving democracy. And this is where I see liberals in the West failing as we do these polls and we see that there's been some fall off in support for democracy in the abstract. And so we say, well, we're not gonna run on that. We're gonna run on gas prices. Um, at the same time, though, I think if people really have spelled out to them what the costs are of losing democracy, because everybody, every minute, everybody misses democracy when it's gone, at least yeah. after a while. And I think that could actually be a key to the kind of effective messaging that could keep the Democrats in power. And after all, the performance of the Democrats in the United States um, is the factor on which the future of democracy in America rests, which leads to my next question for you, which is given the fact that the United States is essentially the guarantor of the existence of democracy elsewhere in the world. Whether we like it or not, it is the arsenal of democracy and a world with a non-democratic America will be a much harder world for other democracies, let's just start with Ukraine, to get along and to thrive. What do you think the possible consequences would be of a Trump and Republican victory? We know in the United States, they've shown and told us that they intend to do away with democracy. They couldn't be clear about this, everything they've done. What effect do you think that would have on global democracy? And in fact, do you think that that's something, that could global democracy survive another Trump term? with a Republican controlled Senate? If not, why not? If so, what would that look like? Uh, yeah, I think it would be pretty disastrous for the democratic world. Um, 
I, I think that um, partly because it wouldn't be uh, like the Trump first administration, which was bad enough, right. but it would be Trump would start where he left off. He, he would probably learn from his errors. There would be no people like McMaster, uh, you know, or relatively conventional people around. He would start with the radicals. Um, and I, I know that ahead of um, the last presidential election, I remember being in Berlin talking to uh, senior foreign policy people there and what they were very scared about what Trump might do in a second term. They felt that he would probably pull America out of NATO and that he would sort of go institutionally to war on the EU. He would try and break up the EU, put it under huge pressure. Uh, and that would be very problematic uh, for, for Europe because we've allowed ourselves to become very, very dependent on the United States, certainly in security terms, and but also market access, but primarily security. I think Emmanuel Macron gets this, which is one of the reasons he is making the argument now, you know, for strategic autonomy of, of the European Union, saying we can no longer rely on the United States. And I'm afraid to say, you know, even though I'm a, you know, regard myself as pro-American, just objectively, I think that's true, uh, you know, because of the threat of, of Trump coming back. But whether the Europeans can build Europe quickly enough, you know, I doubt it, because it's it's a difficult thing to do, uh, you know, marshalling the fiscal resources, the legal resources. So European democracies would be vulnerable. I asked myself, you know, what would happen to Britain? Diplomatically, we would be in very bad shape, you know, because we, having left the EU, we put all our chips on the United States. Right. We'd be uh, so I think a British government would would try to pretend that nothing much had happened here. Um, mm. In fact, I had an interesting conversation in London where we were talking about exactly this scenario, and a woman, not terribly, uh, not necessarily the sharpest government advisor I've come across, but she said to me, "Oh, you know, but Trump's not a fascist." And I said, "Well, actually, you know, I think he kind of is." <laughs> and uh, and Fiona Hill was at the table, and I said, "Fiona, you, I mean, you've worked for him." What do you think? And she said, mm, yeah, you know, ticks a few of the boxes. Uh, but but that sort of struck me that the British Conservatives are still in denial about what Trump really represents and will try to maintain that denial as long as feasible, because it's just too uncomfortable to look it straight in the eye. Well, you know, your remarks really, really uh, give rise to me this I give rise to this idea in my head to to this idea, which is that in some sense, the ideal world from the standpoint of defending democracy and security terms would be a European Union that really does become its own kind of military superpower, right? That can take care of its own security needs, yeah. bonded very closely to the United States and a North America that is still the, the guarantor and has the nuclear umbrella to extend over the region, then you would basically have this alliance, a very close alliance between two, two superpowers in the world to balance off against Russia and China. That in fact might end Which up being- is, as, as you point out, sort of what Biden has created, but temporarily, you know, right. around a single issue, but he has brought the West together. And if we can keep it together, we're in much better shape, uh, you know, with the Russia-China access is looking weaker because of what's happened in Russia, China's embarrassed. Uh, and you know, China, if you put China up against America, statistically, it's looking like a bit more of a matchup. You know, and by some measures, China is as large an economy as, as, as the US. You know, it's the world's largest manufacturer, the world's largest uh, market for vehicles, the world's largest exporter, all of that. Uh, mm -hmm. These are all titles that used to be held by the United States. However, if you put China up against the United West, which is not actually even just a geographical expression, which also includes other advanced democracies, Japan, right. South Korea, and uh, then it looks like an, an uneven contest again, which is why it's so important that America work with allies. Indeed. Great. Well, I'm just going to jump in here because we have so many audience questions and I want to make sure that we can hit on as many as we can. So thank you both for kicking off this very engaging and timely conversation. Um, with that, I'll dive right into our first audience question. So this person says, Gideon, your book comes at a very timely moment with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but you obviously must have started this project long ago. Can you elaborate on your inspiration and process for writing this book in the first place? With pleasure. The authors love that sort of question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, so basically, you know, my 
my day job is writing a, a weekly column uh, for the FT on on global affairs. So I've and I've been doing it for 15 years. So I've seen this process uh, come together. And when I was trying to think, well, what what theme is the big theme in world politics? It struck me that this was it: the rise of these strongman leaders. You could see it anecdotally. I mean, as in there were just more and more of them cropping up. Uh, you know, so as Steve was saying, it starts with Putin in, in 99, 2000, actually just on the hinge, you know, 31st of December, 99. Then you have Erdogan in Turkey in 2003. Then you have Xi in China in 2012, Modi in India, 2014, Trump elected in 2016, uh, MBS 2017, Bolsonaro 2018. So by 2018, which is when I start sort of really sitting down, you can look at the whole world and say, my goodness, the two most populous countries in the world, China and India, both have strongman leaders. Three of the five members of the UN Security Council, China, Russia, the US, have strongman leaders. The two largest countries in Latin America, Brazil and Mexico, because AMLO is a kind of leftist strongman, uh, also have strongman leaders. This is the trend of our times. And so really that was what uh, set me off doing it. And I thought that the way I've done the book is to write an introductory essay trying to pull these threads together and explain the you know, why it might have happened, and then individual chapters on each of them. And I hope that but doing it chronologically, so start with Putin, then Erdogan, then Xi. And I hope that, you know, those who don't want to read the whole book can dip in and just read about the particular leader that interests them. But if you read the whole thing, you get a cumulative picture and you do see that, as Steve points out, how these leaders learn from each other. So that when Putin starts out, initially, we, uh, a lot of people mistake him uh, for a liberal. Steve is actually an honorable exception. I think you were writing about democratic erosion in Russia in 2005, but a lot of people only noticed this around the time of the Munich speech, 2007, the invasion of Georgia, and even then someone like, like Merkel says, oh well Putin's an anomaly, you know, because other leaders are people like Obama and Merkel, they're not these strongman figures, but by 2012 when she comes to power in China uh, and begins to create a personality cult, to write his own thought into the constitution, to you know, break down independent institutions or checks on his own power, you can really see that this, this thing has gone global. And so that's the point where, where I came in and decided to write about it. Great, thank you. And so this next person sort of has a follow up to that answer, but why is this trend happening? What is your explanation for this rise in authoritarian leaders that you trace in your book? Well, I don't think you can point to one thing. Um, it would be satisfying if you could, but uh, it's 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 just not the, the way the world works. But briefly, I would say, you know, four broad trends. I think uh, there's an economic trend, which is the kind of thing, particularly in the West, is important to, to Trump and to Brexit, the rise of inequality, which feeds an anti-elite discourse, which these strongman leaders, they tend to say, you know, I represent the real people and the elite have captured the state. And this is why you need a strong man leader to kind of break through this. And and there are a lot of, by the time Trump takes power, there are a lot of people, as we know, who whose standards of living have fallen. There's the opioid crisis, that kind of thing. So that's the economic part. The second part, though, I think is sort of cultural, particularly fear of migration or fear of it, um, minority groups. And this is pretty global. These leaders are all majoritarians, really. And uh, so just as Trump says, you know, build the wall and even attempts to ban all Muslims from entering the United States, um, other leaders also capitalize on fear, particularly of Muslims, so that Orban in Hungary, who's a key European figure, and, uh, you know, a reference point for a lot of American right wingers, uh, also builds, literally builds a wall to keep out Muslim immigrants from coming into Hungary. Uh, Modi in India um, is a Hindu nationalist more than an Indian nationalist and, uh, you know, campaigns or his party campaign against Muslim influence in India, um, she in turns a million Uyghur Muslims in, in China. Uh, so fear of the idea that the majority is threatened and that they need a strong man to stand up for them. Second key element, two others briefly, I think technology is important. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of this happens in the social media era. And a lot of these leaders are very, very adept users of social media. And one of the reasons I think that social media works for them, is first it cuts up the middleman, sort of boring people like me and Steve who, who can sort of pop up in the traditional media and say, you know, that's untrue. 
that doesn't really matter if you're communicating directly with your followers via Twitter or via Facebook. And also those social media are things which appeal directly to the emotions. And these are politicians who deal in very simple messages, often three words, you know, build the wall in Britain, take back control, or in Russia, you know, invade Ukraine. Simple solutions to complex problems, which would work emotionally on social media, which whips up uh, emotions. And you can see Duterte in the Philippines, who we're just talking about. I gather that people who follow Facebook call uh, the Philippines patient zero, because it was the first time just before the Trump election, where you could see how Facebook was weaponized in a political election campaign uh, as a way of just bypassing the traditional media. And then finally, I think the other thing we talked about was the power of emulation, that Putin is originally, uh, you know, a bit of an anomaly, but then you get more and more of these leaders and they do learn from each other. They pick up tropes like, it's, it's bizarre how many of these leaders have decided that George Soros is the enemy and he's demonized in country after country, whether it's Turkey or Hungary or China even, Russia, his organizations are closed down. And I think this is, Bolsonaro goes after Soros. I think they all hear this name and say, oh, that's useful. He's kind of enemy that, that and, and Trump's going on about him. So maybe he is this Mr. Evil guy and he can be made to epitomize globalism uh, as they call it. And similarly, they pick up vocabularies, the whole thing about fake news. Trump uses that phrase, it's then picked up by uh, by Putin, by Duterte, by Bolsonaro. So uh, a kind of a playbook emerges with that a lot of people can learn from. So I guess those would be my four things. Great, thank you. And so one of those things that you mentioned was religion. And this next person asks, is there a connection between the Christian nationalist movement in the US with the, that in Russia, Hungary, or other countries? I think so. I mean, I think that Putin quite deliberately appeals to it. And I, you know, I was once talking to the former president of the European Commission, uh, Jose Manuel Barroso, who said that he went to visit Putin at some point and Putin said to him, uh, you know, there are only 800 million of us uh, and we must protect ourselves. And he said, Barroso said like 800 million what? He said, Christians in the world, you know, uh, that uh, Putin was presenting himself as the guardian of, of Christianity. And he has made this uh, pretty, uh, sort of cynical alliance with the Orthodox Christians, with, you know, Archbishop Kirill is a very important figure for them. And I think it's part of this cultural traditionalism, because I think these are backlash politicians. They're, they're often a sort of backlash against modernity uh, or against at least secularism, uh, you know, gay rights, Putin bangs on about that and what, what a big mistake it is. And so for those in the West, who are more religious or more traditionalist, they say, well, we don't like the way our society is going, but this guy's got it right. You know, and that, so that, um, and then the other religions too, you know, the, there was a strange week, it was a couple of years ago, where Erdogan re-consecrates the uh, Hagia Sophia, which had become a museum and turns it back into a mosque and says, you know, this is the dream of all Muslims around the world. And a week later, Modi re turns a, uh, a, a Muslim, former Muslim mosque into a Hindu temple and says, this is, you know, the dream of Hindus all over the world. So they are using religion as a sort of cultural rallying point. Now, it's not universal. Uh, it's let, you know, China's a very secular place, so it doesn't really work there. But I think for a lot of these leaders, it's part of, uh, yeah, cultural backlash. Claire, may I add very briefly that it's ironic that Putin himself and, and Trump himself, both of whom are atheists, and both of whom in the minds of, I think, most mainstream Christians look much more like the face of the Antichrist than the, than the face of Jesus Christ, um, have emerged as these self-styled spokespeople of a Christian civilization, which indeed is really, it's remarkable. Um, and it says something about their followers, and it says something about the, the brand of Christianity that, that their followers follow. Yeah, and I think that one of, one of the key ways of uh, identifying corruption in Russia is by taking photographs of leaders' wrists and you can see the incredibly expensive watches they're wearing. And I think Archbishop Kirill had a, had a, a really, really expensive oh, watch on. For a it's man, it's slightly surprising. Um, yeah, that's that's so interesting. I never would have never would have thought to check for the watches. Um, absolutely, so I've seen it done actually. I was at an event with Medvedev. Uh, in Davos, I'm afraid. And uh, at the end, a Chinese uh, blogger came up and said, you know, could I have a photo with you? And he met Bedia and said, yeah, yeah, sure. And he said, could you just like extend your wrist so, so to get, and the reason was he wanted to get the watch. 
because that, that they always want to then identify what watch these people are wearing. Uh, anyway. Fascinating. Um, okay, so this next person says NATO was intended to be a bulwark against Russia. Putin is attacking Ukraine in part because Ukraine wants to be a member of Russia. So after, you know, a few months of war and whatnot, how do you think that NATO should be responding right now? Well, it's a very, very interesting week for NATO because it looks like Finland and Sweden, I think it may be tomorrow, the 12th was the date I was told, will apply to join NATO. And it shows how incredibly counterproductive Putin's um, uh, campaign to roll back NATO has been. In fact, the product has been the expansion of NATO. Now, it is going to be a slightly hazardous moment because you can apply to join NATO, but then there's a several month process where it has to be ratified by parliaments when you're not actually formally in NATO, which is why, incidentally, I think the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is in Sweden today saying we will defend Sweden if it's attacked. So we're, we're trying to create a de facto Article 5 security guarantee before the real one kicks in. But it's it's a hazardous moment. I don't th I think Russia's just too weakened, though, to expand the war by attacking Finland and Sweden. So they will probably just fume from the sidelines, which does, as I say, show how counterproductive it is. I also think I'm in, I was talking uh, to uh, Prince Academic I was having lunch with just before this, and we were agreeing that although Putin has majored on NATO enlargement as this threat to Russian security. I don't, th I'm not sure how sincere that is. I think NATO enlargement is like a code for the fall of the Soviet Union. I think that's what he's really in revolt against. And sure, the fact that, that, that all these countries that used to be at the Warsaw Pact are now in NATO must really sting because it symbolizes how diminished Russia is as a global power. Whether he actually believes that NATO, as he says, was poised to attack Russia, he would, I think, have to be pretty delusional to believe that. This next person uh, notes that you both have focused on the U.S. response uh, to the war in Ukraine. But Gideon, what is the consensus amongst the people in Europe? Is it similar to the public sentiments we see here, or does it differ in any key ways? Well, I think, you know, at least on the surface, it's similar. There's a lot of sympathy for Ukraine. Um, you know, a lot of Ukrainian flags you see all over the place. Uh, interestingly, the Chinese, who always show British soccer over the weekends, the one weekend they took a break was when there were so many Ukrainian flags in the crowds, they didn't want the Chinese public to see that. So it was a sign of, you know, how it really caught the imagination of people. But I think that there are differences, and they may emerge, differences within Europe, I hate to add, they may become more pronounced as this goes on. The countries that are closest to Russia, Poland, the Baltic states, feel very, very strongly about this and are prepared to take an economic hit. Poland has taken in millions of refugees because they can, the, A, they have a, even more sympathy than others for the Ukrainians who are their actual neighbors, but also they feel the security threat very, very, uh, you know, it could be them next, frankly. And so they, they feel this is kind of an existential moment. I think if you're sitting in France or Italy or Spain, it doesn't feel as existential. And the danger for Europe is that as the economic toll mounts, there will be voices saying, you know, maybe we can dial down the sanctions a bit, or, you know, this is inconclusive, we're not getting anywhere. So we need to kind of rebuild relations with Russia a bit. And you've already seen the CEO of Volkswagen saying just that this week. Uh, you know, Germany was the, the big voice within the European Union of those who said, look, let's just do business with Russia. Uh, you know, we need a normal relationship with them, and uh, and maybe that'll produce positive change. Although, you know, I don't know how sincere that argument was, but it was the argument that was made. There's a lot of money to be made. And Germany was, I think, very taken aback, very hum almost humiliated by how wrong they got it. And they had to stop Nord Stream 2, this gas pipeline, which was going to bypass Ukraine and the Baltic states. But those voices in German business have gone quiet, but they haven't gone away. And those very uh, entrenched interests that want to do business with Russia, I think, may start coming back over the course of the next six months to a year. And I'm sorry, last thing, uh, just on this point, I think the other thing is that you've got to remember that, that Euro the European economy is much more entwined with Russia than, than the American economy. So the economic hit that America takes is relatively limited, but Europe's much more dependent on Russian gas. So. Germany, Italy, if they cut off Russian gas tomorrow, 
you know, they won't be able to turn on turn on these sort of machines and factories uh, and energy prices will go absolutely ballistic. So we are continuing to buy Russian gas, although with a goal of phasing it out over the course of a year. But even that will be very challenging. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so this next person asks, what do you make of Macron's comment that it will be a decade before Ukraine gets into the European Union? It appears that Macron is putting U Ukraine aside for his own ambitions to be the lever point between Russia and Europe. Do you view it differently? I think that's one interpretation. I don't think it's necessarily wrong, but I, I tend to see it more as reflecting a couple of things, the, the intense legalism of the European Union um, and the uh, and also the, the, the fact that the French have always been wary of EU enlargement. So I lived through the, the I was living a correspondent in Brussels 2001 to five when uh, the whole first wave of post-Cold War enlargement was happening. And it took a long time. You know, the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. These countries didn't join until 2004, five. It's because if you do it by the book, uh, you have to basically transform your legal system, incorporate 8,000 pages, it was back then, God knows how many pages of EU law there aren't by now, into your domestic legal code, change everything before you can be let in. And that is the Brussels template. And it does take a, a very long time. And it would take particularly long time for a country like Ukraine, which is you know, not very aligned with, with the European system. But to me, that's disappointingly literalist. I would have thought you could say, OK, you know, this is a, a real um, crisis, an exceptional situation. And, and we can accelerate the process a bit. But I think Macron was, what he was trying to do was to find a third way, which in that speech, he said, because it takes so long uh, and it's so arduous, we need to create a sort of another tier of relationship with the EU uh, for countries that aren't yet in it. And I think he has that in mind for Ukraine, but also potentially for Turkey and indeed for the United Kingdom to create a, a close relationship with the EU where you don't necessarily have all the legal protections. But defining what that is, um, is tricky. You know, uh, is it, are we talking a defense thing, a diplomatic thing, a membership of the single market? And if it's not membership of the single market, how close to the single market? It's, it's a whole new project. And in the meantime, Ukraine is out there sort of dangling, uh, in the wind a bit. Uh, so yeah, I thought it was a slightly disappointing thing, but um, I, not that surprising if you know both France and the European Union. Who will rebuild Russia and Ukraine after all of this ends? Yeah, well, I mean, let's start with Ukraine. That is, I think, a big question for the whole peace settlement. You know, Russia has devastated that country. And, um, you know, are we going to ask Russia to pay for the damage? Uh, you know, like the reparations that were imposed on Germany after the First World War. Well, that was actually then regarded as one of the things that eventually led to the rise of Hitler. I don't know whether it did, but it was certainly a grievance for Germany throughout the 1920s. So the idea of reparations, although it feels morally the right thing to do, you know, maybe not. And also Russia is going to be poor itself after this war. So I suspect the answer is that... Uh, Ukraine will be rebuilt by the West, by the European Union, by the United States, and a lot of money will be poured into it. And particularly if we're still in an antagonistic relationship with Russia, you can see us trying to create Ukraine as a sort of alternative model to say, look how good things can be if you align with the West, to turn it into kind of South Korea to Russia's North Korea, if you like, uh, as this country that, that works because it's part of the, the, the Western broad West. So I think that's who will uh, rebuild it. Then who rebuilds Russia depends so much on what kind of a relationship Russia has with the rest of the world afterwards. Um, if, you know, the scenario Steve and I were talking about earlier that a new figure comes in, makes a fresh start, then I think it's, you know, sanctions will be lifted, uh, investment will come back in and maybe the market will begin to rebuild Russia. If not, Russia, I think is very much in China's hands. Um, you know, that uh, they, they, they the only market for their energy will be China, although it will take time to build a new network of gas pipelines. The only people who will supply them with chips, uh, you know, and, and advanced technology, which despite their great scientific achievements, the Russians are not great at manufacturing. They'll be very, very reliant on China. And I think that's another, that's like a geopolitical reverse, both for Russia and actually for the West. 
But interestingly, it's this question of whether even China will want to do it because they will be wary of running foul of Western sanctions and the risk that they get sanctioned by the US, which is a much more important market than Russia, I think is, is making the Chinese hesitate, for example, about supplying Russia with the banking facilities that they've been deprived of or the advanced technological products. So Russia could really be in a, a tight spot unless they can find some way of rebuilding relationships. Well, that leads us right into a handful of questions about China that I'm going to sort of uh, combine and you can answer what you what you like. So one person asks in the work that you did on this book, how are Putin and Xi similar and how are they different? Um, and then uh, second, of course, this question, we get it. We've been getting it for months, but it still is uh, such a big one. Do you think that China will be emboldened to invade Taiwan in the coming months or even years? So I think the Xi-Putin relationship is really interesting. I mean, I think that one of the signs that she is a deeply conservative or reactionary figure is that in one of his earlier speeches, he says to, to the party, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union was a disaster. He has Putin's view of it. And he even circulates a film that they all have to watch about what went wrong. And his argument is that nobody was man enough to stand up and say no when the Soviet Union was unraveling and that we mustn't do that. Uh, we, you know, we must reassert the authority of the party uh, rather than letting it crumble away. And so I think he admires Putin as a strongman figure who is rebuilding, if not the Communist Party, at least the apparatus of the state, the control of the state and attempting to rebuild Russia's great power status. And as a fellow authoritarian, you know, as we were saying, he needs somebody to be able to say, you know, there are other ways than the West is doing it. And so he can look to Russia and say, see, the, that's that's the way to do it, not the way that the West is telling us. In fact, like Putin, he argues that a lot of these Western uh, calls for reform, say independent courts, are a trap. And that if we uh, follow that path, like Gorbachev did, we're going to you know, end up with a country falling apart. So I think that their analysis is very similar. And that leads them to, um, to the paths they take. And you can see that right up to 20 days before the war, there's a joint statement by Xi and Putin uh, about their worldview, essentially, where they both say, you know, the West is trying to bring us down. Um, the West is sponsoring color revolutions, perhaps in Hong Kong or Ukraine. And we stand united against that. Now, the actual precise contexts are different because there is still a communist party running China. There isn't in Russia. Uh, there are other differences between the size of the economy. But I think broadly, their view of the West and their view of the need for authoritarianism and their view of the need for a single figure, coincidentally them, uh, to run the place, that is pretty similar. So I think that, that it's not just a, like a strategic alliance. There is a sort of almost an ideological alliance going on there. On the Taiwan question, I hope that one of the things that, that Ukraine has done is made the invasion of Taiwan seem less attractive. I mean, I'm not saying they're going to abandon it uh, as an idea, but it has outlined that, you know, these glorious small wars can go wrong quite easily. And technically invading Taiwan, which is you know, an island separated by the sea, is much harder than rolling a few tanks into Ukraine. Uh, so, um, you know, it's hard, but I've discussed it with Chinese nationalist friends of mine or people I try to keep up with. And they, they, they sort of try and brush it off and say, well, you know, the Russian army is, you know, incompetent and Russian tech is terrible. But, you know, we, our tech is good and we've trained properly and we, we can do it. But at the back of their minds, I think they must be thinking, hmm. And I think the other thing that will make them pause is this display of Western unity uh, that, they will be hit with Russia style sanctions if they were to try to do that. And China is a highly globalized economy. Um, so I hope it will give them pause, but I'm not sure, you know, it's such a powerful uh, rallying cry for Chinese nationalism, Taiwan. I don't, they're not going to abandon it as a goal. Great. Well, we are at the end of our hour, so I'm going to invite Kim back on to close us out. But thank you both so much for joining us today. We've linked the information to Gideon's new book, Age of the Strongman, in the chat. Um, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Steve, as well. Gideon and Stephen, this was such an informative and timely 
albeit sobering discussion. We'd love to have you both back at a later time as this continuing story develops. So thank you for your expertise and your time today. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you so very much. To our viewers, we have some terrific upcoming programs that I just want to make you aware of. Uh, you can find them all on our website at lawacth.org. On tomorrow, we have Saving Democracy or Undermining It, the Senate's Decisive Role. This is a live stream. On the 20th, Timely Perspectives on Our Nation's Security with Admiral Phil Davidson. This is an in-person members roundtable at the California Club. So if you want more information on that, check on our website or you can call Rachel Kenderdine, our membership manager directly. And of course, we have uh, the LA Mayoral Series on May 24th with candidate Karen Bass. This is at the Ebel Theater. It's just a beautiful venue. Uh, it's in person, obviously, and we would love to see you there. This will be moderated by Dan Schnur. So please check out our website. We hope to see you there. Everybody stay safe. Hope to see you tomorrow. Take care.